Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tim O'Malley. I'm the Vice President for University Relations here at the University of San Diego. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you this morning to the 2018 Kyoto Prize Symposium honoring Dr. Richard Tereskin. housekeeping announcements. If you have a cell phone with you, kindly silence it. At the conclusion of Dr. Tereskin's presentation this morning, we would ask that everyone remain seated for a brief closing ceremony at the end of the program. And lastly, to our high school student guests this morning, we would ask that at the conclusion of the program that you remain in your seats for further instructions. Now, if you would, allow me to make a few special introductions. In addition to the University of San Diego's featured Kyoto Prize laureate, Dr. Tereskin, please join me in also welcoming his counterparts, the 2017 Kyoto Prize laureate in advanced technology, Dr. Takashi Mamura. Dr. Mamura. the 2017 Kyoto Prize Laureate in Basic Sciences, Dr. Graham Farquhar. Dr. Farquhar. <laughs> this morning, we're very honored to have with us from the Inamori Foundation in Japan two distinguished guests. First, Mrs. Shinobu Inamori Kanazawa, the Executive Vice President of the Inamori Foundation. And with her, the Executive Managing Director of the Inamori Foundation, Mr. Shiochi Himono. Mrs. Inamori Kanazawa, we are especially honored to have you with us this morning. This is uh, her first time with us in San Diego for the Kyoto Prize Ceremony, and it's a distinct pleasure. With us also this morning from San Diego's Kyoto Symposium Organization, we have the chair of the board, Mr. David Doyle. David? <laughs> as well, the executive director and secretary, Mr. Richard Davis. Thank you all for being with us. And now, as is the Kyoto Laureate Symposium tradition, it's time to share with you a brief video presentation on the work of the Inamori Foundation, followed by a short account of the life of this year's Arts and Philosophy Laureate, Dr. Richard Tereskin. Let's watch. The annual Kyoto Prize Ceremonies take place each November in Kyoto, Japan. The Kyoto Prize is Japan's highest private award for global achievement. It is given each year by the Inamori Foundation, which was founded in 1984 with the initial private funds of Dr. Kazuo Inamori, founder and chairman emeritus of Kyocera Corporation. Human beings have no higher calling than to strive for the greater good of humanity and society. The Foundation awards three prizes annually in the following fields. Advanced technology, including electronics, bio and medical technology, material science and engineering, and information science. Basic sciences, including biological, mathematical, earth and planetary sciences, astronomy and astrophysics, and life sciences, and arts and philosophy, music, arts, painting, sculpture, craft, architecture, design, theater, cinema, thought, and ethics. The Kyoto Prize Symposium is held in San Diego, California to share the ideas of prize laureates across the globe. 
The philosophy of the Inomori Foundation aims for a future with the proper balance between science, technology, and spiritual maturity, with the goal to contribute to the peace and prosperity of humanity. This is the core mission of the Kyoto Prize. Born in New York in 1945, Richard Taruskin was raised in a house full of music as his attorney father was an amateur violinist and his mother had been a piano teacher. Inspired by a desire to communicate with relatives in Russia, he studied Russian language at Columbia University before furthering his musicology studies at graduate school there and at the Moscow Conservatory. After earning his PhD at Columbia, he joined its faculty. During this period, he was also a choral conductor and toured with the Aulos Ensemble. In the 1980s, while writing for the New York Times, other newspapers, and academic journals, Dr. Taruskin provocatively asserted that contemporary performances of early music were not true examples of authenticity, as was commonly claimed, but rather reflections of late 20th century aesthetics. This argument influenced the early music performance world, and even today, his viewpoint underlies the varied approaches these performances tend to take. In his research of Russian music, Dr. Taruskin adopted an unprecedented method of detailed analysis alongside extensive studies of contextual circumstances, including folkloristics, which radically reshaped our conventional image of the original composers. Dr. Taruskin's deep academic insights reflected in his critical practices have pioneered a new realm of musicology research. He has revealed that in music, creativity can be found not only in composition and performance, but also in meticulous discourse through research on music history and critical analysis. Dr. Taruskin's magnum opus, The Oxford History of Western Music, was published in 2005 and comprises 4,000 plus pages in six volumes. Focusing exclusively on music in the Western literary tradition, this impressive work is likely the largest overview of Western music history ever written by a single author. Following a long and illustrious career as professor of music at the University of California, Berkeley, Dr. Taruskin says, the most sustaining thought I have now is that what I have learned will further be carried forward by my pupils. Dr. Taruskin lives in the Bay Area where he continues to write, exerting profound influence in the field of musicology. His advice to the younger generation, be tolerant. To introduce our laureate this morning, we have invited Dr. Mariana Fao to do the honors. Dr. Fao came to the University of San Diego in 1989. Eleven years ago, she established the Angelus Sacred Early Music Series at USD's Founders Chapel, which marks the current liturgical season with a special concert each year. In her native Germany, she trained as performer of early music, then received her license as music therapist from the Guildhall School of Music in London and finally earned her PhD in historical musicology at Stony Brook University in New York. Her many publications on Hildegard of Bingen and her editions of music for Baroque oboe from European archives, as well as her recordings with the transatlantic ensemble Toot Suite have established Dr. Pfau as a scholar artist. Throughout her career, she has sought out the connections between musicology study, active early music performance as Baroque oboist, and explorations of music for healing purposes. Her courses at USD reflect an interdisciplinary approach to music history and music therapy. And her performing career with well-known Baroque orchestras 
takes her around the world. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Mariana Fow to provide the formal introduction of our distinguished Kyoto Prize laureate, Dr. Fow. There's a little box for me to stand on. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. O'Malley. It is a great honor to introduce Dr. Richard Tereskin, and also a humbling task, I must say. As a fellow musicologist, I stand in admiration of what Dr. Tereskin has accomplished for our discipline. He is the first musicologist ever to have been honored by a prize of global reach like this. While the Kyoto Prize has gone to conductors, composers, and performers before, including, as you might recall, Nicholas Anoncourt, Georgi Ligeti, and Cecil Taylor, um, there has been no laureate in historical musicology until now. This is perhaps no surprise, for musicologists' work is often hidden from public view. We write journal articles, detailing current research, produce editions of musical scores of the past, offer biographies of composers and other musicians, write book-length studies, or university textbooks. Some music historians examine issues in a very close focus. For example, comparing the minutia of text underlay in manuscripts of the 15th century chanson. Others take a broader view and assess larger issues, such as the place of opera in society from the 17th century to the present. But either way, musicology is mostly, let's admit it, an academic discipline. Manuscript studies, style criticism, historiography, and musical analysis typically do not find a large audience outside academia. Therefore, some even have questioned whether musicologists are really essential for music. Can the music not speak for itself? But Dr. Tereskin uh, sees musicology as an integral aspect of music, not only as scholarship, but as an aspect of musical practice. Not many academics have left such a mark on the general discourse about music, as has he, because his commentary has reached far beyond the academy and enlightened, delighted, and at times incensed readers in the general public. He has shown what a vital role commentary can indeed play. Indeed, no one has bridged the gap between music scholarship and mainstream media as brilliantly as Dr. Taruskin, having made his name with a plethora of scholarly publications on all aspects of musicological, uh, musicology and history and performance, including a profound book on Stravinsky, as well as some 160 articles on Russian composers in the New Grove Dictionary alone, Dr. Taruskin then took on the greatest musicological task of all, to write a comprehensive summary of the Western classical music tradition, as we just have seen in the film. As one critic said in 2006, and I quote, the result is surely one of the great cultural monuments of our day, the product of a mind as humane and morally focused as it is technically assured. There's not a page without insight and not a chapter that does not fundamentally change the reader's perspective on its subject matter by making connections and comparisons that call on the author's amazing store of musical and cultural knowledge." End quote. But it is his two collections of essays on music from over 20 years as music critic for the New York Times and the New Republic that have brought Dr. Taruskin's work out of academia and into public consciousness. The 42 essays in The Danger of Music and Other Anti-Utopian Essays, 
have become essential reading for a general public interested in the arts and politics. Hard-hitting, provocative, and incisive, these essays consider contemporary composition and performance, the role of critics and historians in the life of the arts, and the fraught terrain where ethics and aesthetics interact and at times conflict. In wonderfully erudite language, the author translates past musical events into terms the present can easily understand. These together with the earlier collection in text and act from 1995 show Dr. Taraskin as a public intellectual whom Der Spiegel coined America's national musicologist. According to The Guardian, and I quote, in these essays, Taraskin opens your eyes to music you thought you knew, from Bach to Verdi, from Cage to Reich, and above all, forces you to engage with the material of music, its rhythms and pitches, its art and artifice, but even more importantly, its social, political, and expressive power. Whether you agree or disagree with him, you can't help but take a stand." End quote. My students are reading both of these books this semester, and with great delight, I believe. The provocative essay titles uniquely grab their attention. Down with the Fence on music editing, the pastness of the presence and the presence of the past on authenticity and performance practice, or does nature call the tune on biological predisposition toward consonance, or titles such as how talented composers become useless, no ear for music, the scary purity of John Cage, sacred entertainments, that one is on opera, or the musical mystique, defending classical music against devotees. Every one of these essays opens up fascinating perspectives on questions of general significance in our cultural landscape. Inevitably, reading these essays leads to great class discussions. It is clear that Dr. Taraskin isn't merely a sharp thinker, but also a fantastic writer. For students and general public alike, his writing keeps the music he discusses alive and incites engaged intellectual exchange because he can be both so contentious and so convincing. A student observed, his rhetoric is so strong and his acumen so astounding that even his most fervent antagonists are quickly rendered silent. We are having a lively class. As you can perhaps imagine, many of the essays collected in The Danger of Music have excited wide debate, including the title piece, which considers the rights and obligations of artists in the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Never one to dodge debate, Dr. Taraskin addresses the disputes he has stirred up by insisting that art is not a utopian escape, and that artists inhabit the same world as the rest of society. May I close with one with the account of one wonderful anecdote that shows Dr. Taraskin not just as the eminent musicologist and critic, but as one who at heart is truly a musician. The famous St. Lawrence String Quartet was to perform Shostakovich at Stanford. Just a few hours before the performance, the violist became ill. Instead of having to cancel the show, Richard Taraskin saved the day by stepping in ad hoc. He kept the audience spellbound with an extempore talk about the circumstances of the quartet's composition, providing fascinating references to the bi uh, composer's biography, offered a discussion of chamber music's position in Soviet cultural politics, and so on and so on. As if that in itself were not a feat, he referred from memory to specific passages, measure numbers, in the string quartet. He then asked the remaining three players of the string quartet to illustrate his points by playing these passages. 
with himself on occasion humming the missing viola part. I trust that you will enjoy Dr. Tereskin's talk now and then we'll come back at 2 p.m. to hear him talk on the many dangers of music as well. Please welcome Dr. Tereskin to the stage. Thank you. That was one of the great introductions of all time. Uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, in the words of Yogi Berra, let me offer my thanks to all those who have made this day necessary. Uh, <laughs> now, those of us who are lucky enough to reach our eighth decade of life, we're often aware of having crossed a line we were not aware of crossing at the time the line between being a person with the future and becoming a person with the past. Not that we don't hope for a little more future uh, and look, toward, uh, look forward in expectation of continuing fulfilling work, but our past has become a resource for us. And if we're historians, our experiential memories have mingled with whatever we find in documents and books to create the thing that the great German musicologist Karl Dahlhaus called Wissenschaftlich Gefeste Erinnerung, which is very hard to translate, but it means something like systematized recollection, I suppose. Our lived experience helps us in the task of ordering our observations and inferences and making them meaningful. And thus, by informing our daily thinking, our past remains present to us. So now that I've been asked to offer some reflections on my life and work, that's one of the requirements of accepting the Kyoto Prize, I've been thinking with greater con concentration than ever about my personal past. And that is what has prompted the title that stands above this talk and is in your programs. Uh, all was foreseen, nothing was foreseen. Uh, that's a paradox that I think many of us, at least at my age, will find familiar. In one sense, the story of my life is so simple, so straightforward, that it could be summarized in one sentence. At the age of five, I went to school, and I never left. Uh, in fact, if you asked me when I was six what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have said a professor. I visualized myself, even then, with a gray beard, standing in front of a class and lecturing. And as you see, I have it. I mean, the gray beard. Um, until three years ago, I lectured regularly before classes. And now I still do it quite often before audiences of various sizes and in many places. When I was six, my stereotyped mental picture of myself as a professor included a cap and gown, which American professors wear only once a year, and never in the classroom. But other than that, you might say that my life and work were entirely foreseen by the age of six but you would be wrong. My path to what I foresaw for myself did not run smoothly, and although I did end up in the classroom, for scholars, that only describes the job, not the work. The job is what earns the money that supports the work, or as I used to joke, the job is what supported my habit of scholarship. Uh, the work is the activity that produces the creative output. The job enters into it, but only as one strand in a skein. And when I think of the course my creative work has followed, I'm always amazed at its contingency. Nothing about it was straightforward. Nothing about it was predictable. So much was the result of happy accident 
so much indeed that I half believe in providence, even though I can't really profess religious faith. I used to remind my students that a significant career requires three things. It requires aptitude, it requires ambition, and it requires luck. Which is to say, we need the ability to do the work. We need the capacity to formulate our own goals. I mean, that's what ambition is. Uh, we need the drive that motivates us to persevere in the often arduous pursuit of our goals. And we also, of course, need the opportunity that makes it possible to reach our goals. We are responsible for the ability and the ambition. And we can prepare ourselves to seize the third, that is, our opportunities, but only if opportunity knocks. And of course, that's a matter of chance. As our language tells us, that is, the English language tells us, by making one of the meanings of chance a synonym for opportunity. It was chance that made a musicologist of me to begin with. Music, as you heard in the introduction, was my consuming interest as early as I can remember, even as I nurtured the ambition to be a professor. My mother was a piano teacher, and she started me on piano lessons at the age of eight with a friend of hers as my teacher. She knew better than to try teaching me herself. My father was an attorney and an enthusiastic amateur vi violinist, and very early in life, I was informed that I would eventually play the cello so that we'd have a trio in the family. Uh, I started those lessons, that is cello lessons, at the age of 11. At the age of 13, I went to New York City's special high school for music and art, where I learned music theory, and I even started to study composition. It was by no means a foregone conclusion, though, that when I became a professor, it would be of music, even though that is what I eventually did. There was family pressure, as there so often is, to choose a better paying profession than an academic one. And there were other interests that unexpectedly impinged. The most compelling of these outside interests was a result of a surprising event that befell my family. Both of my parents were American-born children of Jewish immigrants to the United States from what was then the Russian Empire. My father's family came from what is now Latvia, and my mother's came from what is now Ukraine. Both of them both of these territories were in what was known as the Pale of Settlement, the area on the western fringe of the Russian Empire where Jews were permitted to live. And those were precisely the territories that were occupied by the Germans during the Second World War. My grandparents were sure, and I grew up believing, that we had no relatives left in Eastern Europe. Any who remained would have perished during the German occupation. And then, in 1958, when I was 13, and after three of my four grandparents had died, we learned to our amazement that a whole family of cousins of my father had moved after the Russian Revolution to Moscow and had grown up and flourished there. A delegation of rabbis from America had gone to the Soviet Union for a tour. They were met by an official guide whose surname was familiar to one of the rabbis, who had a man with the same name in his congregation at home. And it turned out that the two men with similar names were half-brothers, and that both of them were first cousins of my father's. My father, who grew up speaking Yiddish, the language of the Eastern European Jews, began writing to his cousin, who sent us a lot of gifts, including, for me, many recordings of Russian operas. I had to write thank you notes, of course. I didn't know Yiddish, so writing to my Russian relatives became my first and entirely unforeseen incentive to study Russian when I went to college. It led to an overwhelming interest in the Russian language and its literature, and I actually became a Russian major as an undergraduate at Columbia University. 
when I started graduate school, also at Columbia, I returned to music, which was my first love, but now I had a rather unusual bit of equipment for studying music, at least for an American music student. I wasn't immediately moved to use it, however. I'm talking about knowing the Russian language, of course. I wasn't immediately used, uh, moved to use it. As an undergraduate, I continued to study composition and was as strongly drawn to composition as a field of professional study as I was musicology. For two years, I actually pursued a double program as a graduate student, studying musicology, so to speak, in the mornings and working on compositions in the afternoons. I was hopelessly torn between them. Whenever I was doing musicology, I would think, ah, composing is so easy. All you have to do is make things up. And whenever I was working on a composition, I would think, ah, musicology is so easy. All you have to do is look things up. Uh, what finally decided me in favor of musicology as a degree pursuit was an unexpected presence. As a topic for a master's essay, which was then required at Columbia University, I wrote about a man named Vladimir Stasov. He was a Russian arts journalist uh, of the 19th century who was very close to many of the Russian composers who were his contemporaries. Uh, so close that in my thesis, I called him the sixth member of the five, the five being a famous group of Russian composers. Hearing of this plan, my aunt in Moscow, that is the widow of the cousin of my father who had first made contact with us in America, she would be uh, in American reckoning or in English language reckoning, uh, the widow of my first cousin once removed, but in Russian, she'd be my aunt once removed, so I always called her aunt. Well, she persuaded a friend of hers to part with a huge three volume edition of Stasov's writings, and she sent it to me to help with my research. Overwhelmed with her generosity, I determined that I had to find a way to go to Russia and meet her and my other relatives there. And the only way I saw that I could do this was to apply for a fellowship that would support a doctoral project in Russia. And so I decided I would pursue the doctorate in musicology, not in composition, and that I would write about Russian music. I narrowed the subject down to Russian opera during the decade of the 1860s. I was very strongly advised not to do this. Neither Russian music nor 19th century music were generally considered appropriate subjects for research in the American Academy of those days, the late 1960s. Until then, I had been a most obedient student. Indeed, there's an old edition of the so-called Hewitt Catalog of Dissertations in Musicology in which you can find my dissertation in progress as originally announced on the masses of a composer named Henrikus Isaac, a 15th century Flemish composer. Now, that was considered kosher for musicology. <laughs> But my life had taken some fateful turns, and I now had compelling personal reasons to work in a field that did not promise success in America. What made my seemingly foolish choice of a dissertation topic ultimately profitable couldn't have been predicted at the time, could not have been predicted. And besides, another unforeseen turn brought me within a hair's breadth of leaving musicology, indeed of leaving the academy, uh, the academy altogether. The first research paper I wrote as a graduate student, uh, that would, be, would have been in the fall of 1965, was on a topic assigned to me by the professor who taught the introductory pro seminar, exactly the course that I then taught for about 40 years, both at Columbia and then later at Berkeley. But when I was a student, it was being um, taught by a professor named Paul Henry Lang, who was probably the most famous American musicologist of those days. And his manner of teaching was by today's standards impermissibly autocratic. He knew that I played the cello, and so he assigned me um, what, is sure, what surely seemed the most natural topic in the world, 
according to his lights and those of the discipline as it was then practiced. The transition, as he put it, from the viola de gamba to the cello in the 18th century. What I eventually found out in doing the assignment that there was that there had been no such transition. Uh, the early players of the cello were not former viola de gamba players, and the two instruments belonged to different instrumental families, and they had very different social uses. But that's not important. What was momentously import important to me at the time was my discovery of the viola da gamba as an instrument that I could play. One of my classmates already played it, and I asked her whether I could see her instruments and learn some rudiments of its playing technique. She sensed an opportunity to make a convert, and so she offered to get me an instrument that I could practice on, and also she put me in touch with her teacher and I became the most enthusiastic convert imaginable. Uh, you could say I made the opposite transition to the one that I was researching. I went from the cello to the viola de gamba. Uh, almost overnight, I practiced the gamba much more seriously than I ever practiced the cello, and much more seriously than I was then doing musicology. It really took over my life, and if I'd had the chance, I would have made it my profession and I almost got the chance. A few years after I'd begun playing, the New York Pro Musica, which was the leading American performing ensemble for early music then, and the only one in the country that could pay its members a living wage, and in 1970, they paid $12,000 a year. That was a living wage. Um, they advertised an opening for an unspecified string player both viola de gamba players and players of the lute applied. After the auditions, the group let it be known that the choice would be made between the top gambas and the top lutenists. That is, between me and one of my closest friends who had auditioned on the lute. They kept us waiting for more than a month before announcing that they had decided on the lutenists. I was dashed. It was perhaps the greatest disappointment of my life. If I'd been offered the job, I would have accepted it with joy. I would have withdrawn from the doctoral program at Columbia and become a full-time performing musician, and I would somehow have had to justify that decision to my grieving parents, who would have regarded the decision as a fatal mistake. But I never had to disappoint them like that. In fact, I don't even think I ever told them that I had applied for the job. I went back to Columbia, tail between my legs, and I resolved on going through with the decision I have already described to get a fellowship for a year study in Moscow and write a dissertation on Russian opera. I did this very reluctantly and in a state of dejection. And now I will depart from strict chronology and fast forward, as we say, a dozen years to the early 1980s long after the New York Pro Musica had dissolved, after I had earned my doctorate and joined the faculty at Columbia, and where I was by then the director of graduate studies, the person to whom applications for admission to the program were addressed. And who do you think addressed an application to me? None other than my old lutenist friend. Uh, who had beat me out in competition for a job with the now defunct Pro Musica all those years ago, and she was now unemployed and belatedly seeking a degree in musicology that would enable her to find academic employment. Well, as you can imagine, I uttered a silent prayer of thanks for my narrow escape from her fate to the providence in which or in whom I have in some sense believed ever since. Of course, what I'm calling providence can also be called contingency or fortuity or blind luck, which can come in all kinds of surprising disguises, including apparent failures in a performing career. Other manifestations of blind luck in my life have been undisguised and so abundant 
as to destroy completely any idea that I could ever have ha uh, had, or any idea that I could ever have had that I owed the successes I've enjoyed solely to my own efforts and deserts. There is, for example, the matter that I've already promised to explain, namely how my foolish decision to write a doctoral dissertation on a topic as unpromising as Russian opera eventually bore fruit. When I finished my dissertation, it certainly seemed like what we call a white elephant, you know, uh, a possession, according to the dictionary, uh, that is useless or troublesome, especially one that is expensive to maintain or difficult to dispose of. Uh, yeah. One's dissertation can indeed be difficult to dispose of. Uh, what one normally does to dispose of a dissertation in addition to seeking publication for it as a book, is to get individual chapters published as articles in professional journals. I didn't think there was any chance of doing that with a dissertation on Russian opera, um, considering the predilections of academic musicology and, of course, the predilections of the editors of those publications. And then one day in 1976, the year after I finished my degree, I read an advertisement in one of the standard musicological journals that a new musicological journal was being launched at the University of California by the University of California Press and with the trio of University of California professors as editors. The journal, unbelievably enough, was to be called 19th Century Music, and its stated purpose was to gain acceptance and currency for that repertoire within the American Academy. The advertisement ended with a call for submissions. It was a precisely crafted answer to my unstated prayers. And I feverishly produced a version of my dissertation's opening chapter, modified so as to be self-sufficient rather than as part of a longer narrative, and I sent it off this time, of course, with an actual uttered prayer. And several weeks later, I heard back from the senior member of the editorial team, Professor Joseph Kerman of Berkeley, who was, if Lang was the most famous, surely the second most famous musicologist of those days, telling me that my article was accepted and would appear in the maiden issue of the new journal. In fact, it appeared in the second issue. Uh, but I wasn't counting, and I wasn't complaining. The new journal did not only provide me with a, an outlet for a dissertation chapter, it was my scholarly home for the next several years, during which I published four articles on Russian music, including a major study of Mussorgsky's Boris Godunov that was serialized in two consecutive issues so that my byline appeared in five issues out of the journal's first 12 and I began to have a reputation. But this was not the only benefit I derived from this particular providential intervention, or even the major one. Becoming acquainted with Joseph Kerman was the real life changer for me, culminating eventually in my moving together with my growing family to join the Berkeley faculty in 1987. Joe Kerman, was on a mission to change musicology in fundamental ways. And luckily for me, he saw my work as useful to him in that endeavor. In return, I had the benefit of his editorial hand, one of the most formative experiences in my life as a writer. The most formative, however, was another one that came to me just as fortuitously. One day in 1984, I was sitting in a restaurant near Columbia, having breakfast and reading the newspaper, you know, minded my own business, when an old friend showed up and told me some interesting news, that one of his friends, having bolted from the staff of a record collector's magazine called High Fidelity, I bet some of the old timers in the audience today might remember High Fidelity magazine, um, 
he had bolted, and he was starting up his own, more serious magazine called Opus, and was looking for writers. Shortly afterwards, a Slavic scholar on the faculty of the University of California, whom I had met at a Stravinsky Centennial Conference in 1982, that was here in San Diego, by the way, uh, but I lived in New York then, uh, passed along to me a reviewing assignment from the New Republic, you know, the magazine, the New Republic, a journal of political opinion, which he was forced to decline because of a conflict of interest. The author of the book under review was his doctoral student. So that's how I was put in contact with two editors, James A. Streich of Opus and Leon Wieseltier of the New Republic, with whom I collaborated regularly for almost 30 years and through whom I became the one American musicologist to appear, uh, to appear regularly, not as a critic, but as a book and record reviewer and a musical commentator. Uh, in the mass circulation press. See, I, that's how I became America's national musicologist or public musicologist, as I've often been called. But you can already see that it was pure happenstance that gave me my opportunity to become that. But it was even more fortuitous than that. I started writing for Opus magazine in 1984, and the magazine folded in 1988. That was my second biggest career setback after being rejected by the New York Pro Musica. For two years, I thought my little fling as a public musicologist had ended, but then Jim A. Streich got himself hired as the Sunday music editor at the New York Times. He began remustering his old troops, as he said, and that gave me access to the largest audience a writer on classical music in America could ever dream of having. Between 1990 and 2012, I published more than 60 pieces in the New York Times. I lasted there because I found it congenial to write about music in relation to what has always been a prim uh, the primary concern of any newspaper, uh, that is, social and political issues. And I would be very surprised if that stint as a very public and often controversial commentator didn't have a great deal to do with my ending up standing here today. Uh, it was far from what anyone would call my most important work, the writing I did for the Times and the New Republic, and it's far from what I would hope to be my most lasting work, but however ephemeral it was the work that brought my name to the attention of a readership that extended far beyond the walls of the academy. But more important to me than that, the New York Times gave me my most rigorous and valuable training as a writer. Saying what I had to say within the confines of a newspaper column taught me a lesson that few academic writers ever learn. It taught me to be concise. You notice people are laughing. Uh, people always laugh when I say that I've learned to be concise uh, because I'm known for writing outlandishly long books. You know, six volumes, for example. Uh, my monograph on Stravinsky's so-called Russian period was in two very fat volumes, and it totals about 1,800 pages. The Oxford History, as you've already heard, it was published in six and more than 4,000 pages. But I have striven and exhorted my pupils as well, often to use the fewest possible words to say what you have to say, no matter how complex the argument, no matter how many parts it contains. You know, so I would contend, and again, I'm sure I'll get another laugh, that uh, if I wrote a book that contains 4,000 pages or uh, two and a half million words, that was exactly the number I needed. Not a word, not a word more believe that, because I firmly believe it. Um, because, you see, it was only the fact that I, as editors say, wrote short that I could get away with writing such long books. Uh, the New York Times taught me how to do it. And you know, if I hadn't been sitting in the right restaurant on the right day in 1984, I never would have learned. But now I suspect that you're convinced like, that like everyone else, I stumbled blindly into what in retrospect looks like a coherent career. 
How it happened may be an interesting story, and I hope it has been so far, but it's an ordinary story. All careers look coherent in retrospect, but are likely to have been blind stumbles in prospect. And that observation contains an important lesson for historians, who are often tempted by their knowledge of events and their outcomes to construct deterministic narratives and even look for the laws of history that govern them. Uh, that is a folly that has led not only to a lot of bad historiography, but also to massive human suffering because historical determinism is the natural ally of totalitarian politics. But the fallacy of determinism is easily detected, easily described, and my little history of my own career shows how. It is only when we regard events in retrospect that causes look like causes in the narrow sense of the word. What determinist historians do is construct their causal narratives backwards, because they have knowledge that the actors didn't have, yeah? Uh, so they, cause, they construct the causal narrative backwards, and then forgetting that the past was once the future, they recount them forwards with equal assurance that, that causes, which are in reality only anterior events and conditions, inevitably beget effects, which are in reality nothing more than outcomes. That fallacy is what turns contingencies into apparent necessities. And that's why Yogi Berra was um, inadvertently funny when he said, thank people for making this day necessary. Uh, there was nothing inevitable, let's say, about the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, which no one foresaw until it was upon us, uh, or of the Tsarist Empire before it. Nobody thought it was going to crumble in 1917. Nothing inevitable about the so-called collapse of tonality, which you'll read about in every history of music. That never took place at all. Uh, and there was nothing inevitable about the shape of my career or anyone else's career. Nothing in any of these events could have been foreseen. As Alexei Yurchak put it in the title of his wonderful book on the Soviet collapse, everything was forever until it was no more. So that's the end of my sermon, but not quite the end of my lecture, because I haven't yet told you about the most astonishing contingencies that have enabled me to do the work I have been able to do. The first time any work of mine made waves within the profession was when I proposed, as I think Mariana has already mentioned, uh, that the revival of old ways of performing music, what was then called authentic performance practice, was not in fact the revival of historical performance styles, but rather a newly invented style that took its bearings not from the aesthetics of the past, but from the aesthetics of modernity. It was indeed a modernist style, passing itself off, as modernist styles often do, as a historical revival. When I first advanced this idea in 1981, the idea was regarded as, well, let's just say counterintuitive, to put it mildly. Um, but by the time I gave it its most extended exposition in an essay that was published in 1988, it had won some currency, and you know by now it's the accepted view. What made it ultimately convincing was the evidence that I was able to present in support. I remember so vividly the first time I encountered that evidence. I had just begun to do research, the research that led to my Stravinsky monograph. I came to Stravinsky from my previous study of Russian music, which began, as I've already mentioned, with my formal degree exercises, my master's essay of 1968 on Stasov, and my doctoral dissertation of 1975 on the Russian operas of the 1860s. At the same time, as I've also already told you, I was heavily engaged in the performance of early music as a viola de gamba player and also by then as a choral conductor. 
Now, these two aspects of my professional activity, Russian music research on the one hand and early music performance on the other hand, were quite unrelated in their origins within my life <coughs> and quite remote from one another in their purview. And they had never touched, nor did I ever expect them to touch. They amounted, in Franz Liszt's expression, to a sort of vie bifurque, a musical life divided, uh, happily divided, I should say, in two. But now that I'd embarked on a study of Stravinsky, I needed to acquaint myself with the basic tenets of, uh, and the basic texts of aesthetic modernism. Now, since the best way of learning a new subject is to teach it, I announced a seminar on the theory of modernism, and I began reading up in preparation for the seminar. One day, sitting in my office, preparing for the first meeting of the class, I read two texts for the first time. One was called Speculations, and it was the collected essays of a critic called T.E. Hume. And the other was a book originally published in Spanish as La Deshumanización del Arte, or The Dehumanization of Art, by a uh, Spanish philosopher named Jose Ortega y Gasset. And this was one of my great eureka moments because I immediately recognized in their words, Hume's and Ortega's, um, the discourse that reigned within the world of early music, and that had no counterpart at all in the actual historical texts uh, in which, on which the early music movement professed to base its practice. Once I realized this, it was easy to see that what we were calling authentic or historical performances of old music were no more like the performances the music would have had when it was new than a neoclassical concerto by Stravinsky resembled an actual concerto by Bach or by Mozart. The assumption that the radical 20th century break from romantic or 19th century performance practice was in fact a return to 18th century and earlier ways, that was spurious it was easy to show that the performances we're giving now did not have 18th century counterparts. Now everyone can see this. Why was I the first to see it? Only because, quite fortuitously, my musical life had been divided the way it was into those two seemingly unrelated and unrelatable Russian music and early music halves. Only because I came to the reading of modernist texts having been trained in early music did I see the correspondences that are now almost universally acknowledged. If I, with my idiosyncratic and fortuitous combination of interests, had not made these discoveries, it's possible that no one would have made them. I wasn't uniquely gifted, certainly not clairvoyant, but I was uniquely equipped and that had been the matter of merest, sheerest chance. And now for the most improbable and therefore most amazing set of contingencies of all. When I began my research on Stravinsky, I did not have in mind an ambitious plan comprehensively to study his early development in Russia and his early works against the background of Russian music. I couldn't hope to write such a book because there was a practical impediment. Stravinsky had kept most of his manuscripts in his personal possession during his lifetime. After his death, possession had passed to his heirs who were divided into two hostile groups. His three surviving children on the one hand and his widow, not their mother, but his second wife, and his assistant, whose name was Robert Kraft, on the other hand. So from the moment of Stravinsky's death, his estate was in litigation. And in consequence, it was inaccessible to scholars. My own early inquiries were always answered very discouragingly by lawyers. Uh, and you know, 
the worst letter you can get as a scholar is a letter from a lawyer. Uh, imagine then my elation when I received a phone call from a former graduate student at Columbia who was then employed as an assistant at the New York Public Library to inform me that the New York Surrogates Court had awarded the New York Public Library temporary custodianship of the Stravinsky estate while its disposition was being adjudicated, that the library had made it a condition that as long as it had custody as a public library, the contents of the estate would be made available to the public, and in consequence, that I now had free access to it. This at a time when I lived a 10-minute subway ride from the library, and blessing of all blessings, I had just begun a full year's sabbatical from teaching that coincided almost exactly with the duration of the library's custodianship. For 10 blessed months in 1983 and 1984, I virtually lived at the library, where I had a freedom of access to Stravinsky's manuscripts that no one has had since because I was able to examine and actually physically handle the actual physical documents rather than microfilms or photocopies, which the Paul Zacher Foundation in Basel, Switzerland, which was the eventual purchaser of the estate, and now only permits under exceptional circumstances. So this was a stroke of fortune such as I have never had before or since, nor has any other scholar that I know. Uh, whenever I tell people who are working on the Stravinsky manuscripts now through the Basel Foundation that I actually held them in my hand, you know, my fingerprints are on them, and I could sort them out at will and compare them side by side, all the things you can do when you have physical access, they turn green. Uh, and it was just a stroke of good timing, shall we say, good fortune. But I've had many other such strokes, not as spectacular as that one, perhaps, but also crucial determinants to my life's course. I could go on regaling you with stories of my lucky life, but I'm sure I've already told you more about me than you ever wanted to know. And you are already, perhaps, wondering whether I really deserve a prize for receiving so many blessings. I wonder, too. And in my acceptance speech, I said, in Kyoto, that no one can truly deserve a, an award such as the Kyoto Prize. I also know from rumblings that have reached my ear from afar that my particular field of endeavor has made the award in certain quarters all the more a cause for wonder, even a bit of annoyance that a musicologist is getting such a thing. In announcing my selection, the Inamori Foundation seemed to anticipate this taking note that a precedent had been broken in giving a prize that had formerly gone to composers and performers to a writer on music or a scholar of music, and that perhaps explanations were in order. To honor my work, the foundation stated in its citation was to acknowledge that in music, creativity can be found not only in composition and performance, but also in meticulous discourse, contextualizing the art. I'll count it as the greatest of all my blessings if this generous assessment, not only of my work, but of my field of endeavor, should, uh, should set a precedent whereby it will not look so strange the next time a musicologist is taken as a worthy recipient of a prize in music. That it was my work as a music historian that should have occasioned this broadening of the prize's purview and this breaking of a precedent is, of course, very gratifying to me, but it too is attributable to newly propitious circumstances. You know, it's widely acknowledged in the historical profession now that the influence of economic and, glo and social globalization has brought about a so-called global turn in historiography as well, whereby in the words of Richard J. Evans, the eminent historian of 20th century Germany, Historical reputations are made with, not with narrowly empirical monographs, but with novel concepts and methodologies, new interpretations, and large-scale ambitious works of synthesis. Well, for better or worse, that's me. 
with my sixth volume, Oxford History of Western Music, which owes its existence, and by now should go without saying, to another set, or rather a whole chain of unforeseen and unforeseeable lucky breaks. But from these fortuities has emerged perhaps a measure of poetic justice. Musicology, I seize my opportunity here to declare, deserves its recognition among musical pursuits. You know, uh, that it should ever have been regarded as secondary to composition and performance, or that Jean Sibelius, the Finnish composer, should have been thought wise when he reminded everybody that there never was a statue built in memory of a critic. Um, that's only an historical happenstance. That is only a prejudice. There have been other views. The philosopher Boethius ranked the three types of persons who concerned themselves with music in precisely the opposite order. At the bottom, he put performers whose efforts, when I do this, that means I'm quoting, okay, uh, whose efforts are devoted to the exhibition of their skills with instruments and who therefore act as slaves without reasoning or thinking. That's Boethius, not me. Uh, in the middle came what we would call composers. Boethius called them poets, which means makers, who compose more with their natural instincts than through the exercise of thought or reason. And on top were the people like me, <laughs> whom Boethius exalts by calling them critics, which in Latin means judges. Uh, those who, because they are wholly devoted to reason and thought, are able to judge modes, rhythms, the genera of songs and their mixtures by virtue of their ability to use reason and thought in a manner especially suited to the musical art. So there. Uh, well, I won't insist on that hierarchy or on any hierarchy, but I do think that we who, get, who tell the story, we do get the last word. And we deserve some recognition for that. Those who presume to outrank us forget that we're the ones who assigned them their place. One of my favorite stories, and for reasons you'll surely understand, one of the favorite stories of my pupils, to whom I love to tell it, concerned the great, the great Swedish economist Gunnar Myrdal, who, when warned by one of his teachers that he should be more respectful towards his elders because it is we who will determine your promotion, answered, yes, but it is we who will write your obituaries. <laughs> yeah. I read that in his obituary, by the way. <laughs> uh, this quip has particular relevance to the fantastic honor that the Inamori Foundation did me by recognizing my work as a musicologist alongside that of so many truly eminent composers and performers. With the exception of Cecil Taylor, who works within a tradition other than the one that I've taken as my beat, I've written about all my predecessors. That probably is the difference between me and them. I've written about them. Uh, in some cases, I've written quite extensively about the people who received the music award before me. And in all cases, I have striven to do, as the Kyoto Prize citation has noted, I have striven meticulously to contextualize their art. And I have not always been thanked for it. Contextualizing has, me has meant describing their work seriously in the way that I have described my own work today in a more ironic or paradistic vein. In terms of a dialectic, a push and pull between a more or less powerful agent and the enabling and constraining conditions within which the agent acts. In my own case, I have spoken somewhat simplistically about luck. What I meant, of course, is that like all agents, I could only exercise my abilities within a particular circumscribing environment. Like my predecessors, I strove to make the most of my opportunities, or what we now prefer to call affordances. And in this, I was aided by my ambition. 
and the strategies I was able to contrive in order to realize it. To speak of enabling conditions, and particularly to speak of ambition and strategy, has often seemed to those used to more idealizing or decorous ways of accounting to diminish the achievements of the great. But even those who have opposed my work, and I have been battered as well as flattered by its reception over the years, uh, they must be aware, if they're at all capable of introspection, that their own activity has been subject to constraints that they have had to negotiate through strategy. The implicit endorsement the Kyoto Prize has given my efforts and my methods, if it serves to encourage a more realistic and informative historiography of art, gives me additional reason, and the most powerful one of all, to be grateful. Thank you very much. Dr. Tereskin. Uh, it occurs to me that regardless of our chosen professions and whether we have a little more past or a little more future in our lives at this point, that we might all be excited about the possibilities of what might be uh, despite our best laid plans. Uh, thank you again for uh, sharing with us not only your particular story, but also the opportunities that I think we can all uh, anticipate uh, in our lives. I had mentioned at the top of the program that we have a traditional brief closing ceremony each year as part of the Kyoto Prize Symposium here in San Diego. And to conduct that uh, brief ceremony, I would ask that you help me welcome to the stage the um, chair of the board of directors for the San Diego Kyoto Symposium organization, Mr. David Doyle. David? Well, it, um, it's a sign of such a enjoyable and excellent presentation that uh, I feel compelled to, uh, to make a comment. Uh, and I just want to thank you, Dr. Truskin, for contextualizing for us in such an enjoyable, entertaining way um, your career and your accomplishments. Thank you. And I must say, you blended so well the elements of the subject matter, and the performance. Well, we have done it again. I am proud to announce the official conclusion of this year's Kyoto Symposium events. San Diego and the host universities have the unique honor to be the only North American site where the Kyoto Prize laureates come to celebrate and share insights that led to their selection. We again express our gratitude to the Inamore Foundation for choosing San Diego as the first city to share with Kyoto the celebration of the Kyoto Prizes. Thank you. The ideas and achievements of our 2018 or 2017 laureates have fundamentally affected our lives. Dr. Takashi Mimura has changed the speed of communication in every aspect of our lives. Dr. Graham Farquhar has changed our understanding of photosynthesis, on which all life on Earth depends. And Dr. Richard Truskin has changed our understanding of Western music. We have been moved by your inspiration and passion over the last three days. Thank you, and I would greatly appreciate it if you'd stand one more time so we can give you another final recognition at this closing.
to extend a very large thank you to the people and organizations who have worked together so hard and so well to make the 2018 Kyoto Price Symposium such a success once again. The result of your collective efforts each year positively changes our community. I look forward to seeing all of you and celebrating with all of you again at the 2019 Kyoto Symposium next spring. Thank you. <laughs>